Hello there, and in today's video we are discussing the fur trade. So the fur trade on its just its surface area, you think about it, it was an exchange of goods between European and American groups and native cultures that lived in this area. But there's much more to that, and that's what we're going to explore in this video. Not only are we going to talk about the kind of items that each group brought to the table when they were trading, but we're going to talk about the impact they had, how this was uh, a form of business, a form of politics, a form of dependence, a forming of a relationship, and many other things. So the fur trade is very important to our understanding of native groups and European and later American groups in this area. So there's a lot to it. We're really excited to explore this. So follow me as we explore the fur trade. So for native groups that lived here in this area, when the French arrived, the first Euro European group arrived in the late 1600s and started trading with the native groups that lived here, the Miami and the Potawatomi, this was something that these native groups were very comfortable with and something they were very familiar with. And the reason is, is that these groups have been trading for hundreds of years and decades and generations, dating all the way back thousands of years to the archaic period. And we know that because we have some items here in our case in the exhibit here at the museum that were found in Elkhart County that are not native here. These things like obsidian and quartz, these materials came from different parts of our nation, well, what becomes the United States, and even different countries. For example, obsidian grow or is found in places in Mexico and Central America and South America. So the reason these things made it all the way up here was through trading. So the archaic period dating back hundreds and thousands of years ago, even before the first Europeans stepped foot in North America, native groups were trading. So think about it today and we can compare it to when you order something online. You can't find it in a store near you. You can't find it uh, driving a few different places. What, what do we do today? Well, we just hop on the computer and find the item on a website and we order it online and a few days later it gets shipped to us. That was happening thousands of years ago. Now, they didn't use the internet, they used a trade network. So anything someone really wanted or needed, it might take a long time, but they could get it. So say for example, groups living here, archaic groups living here in what becomes Elkhart County wanted this piece of obsidian because that rock was hard and was very good for making tools and weapons, they could send a request through trade networks from group to group to group that creates kind of this chain link that stretches all across the land. And they would make their way through and send items up and down the trade network, things that they had that they could use that were valuable, and they would return and get things back. So things like these items that you see here. So for the native groups that were trading with the Europeans when the Europeans arrived here, trading for them was nothing new. And in fact, the Europeans weren't starting this new trade network. They were into entering into something and a system that had been going on for decades and generations. So what we're talking about with the fur trade are all the different impacts. And one big impact, impact is that it caused conflict amongst native groups because of the demand that Europeans placed on it. And this happened even before any Miami or Potawatomi encountered a European in this area. So before Miami and Potawatomi were trading with French starting in the late 1600s, they were affected by the fur trade. And it was all over the demand and the desire of European groups for beaver fur. So in the, along the Atlantic coast of North America, uh, European groups, the British and the Dutch, were exploring these regions, encountering native groups that lived there, the, the Iroquois mostly, and were trading with them and started to trade with a number of different furs, but beaver slowly became the most popular and most desired fur. So you had the European groups asking and demanding more beavers to trade with the Iroquois. So the Iroquois began to hunt more and trap more and get as many beavers as possible. And eventually the population of beaver in the eastern part of North America became overhunted and the numbers disappeared 
and there weren't any more beavers, but that didn't stop these European groups from wanting and desiring them. So the Iroquois, what they did is they began to move west and come into territory that was owned by other native, or, or owned and used by other native groups like the Miami and the Potawatomi here. And when the Iroquois, Iroquois groups would enter into these areas, Sometimes they were welcome, sometimes they were not, because they were taking uh, supplies that the, these groups that were living here used and needed themselves. So there was a period in the 1600s known as the Beaver Wars. So the Iroquois, backed by European groups, were supplied with weapons and other supplies that they needed, and they came west, they pushed into territory not owned by them or controlled by people like the Miami and Potawatomi and fought against these groups all over territory that beaver lived on. So they can continue their trade with these groups. And this caused panic, this caused warfare, this caused conflict, and it caused a refugee crisis. Because if there's conflict going on, Miami and Potawatomi that were living here, that were afraid and couldn't fight from themselves uh, because the weapons that the Iroquois had now had guns and they were outgunned and outmanned, the Miami and Potawatomi fled for safety. So they went along the route of Lake Michigan, they went around the southern tip and up north and eventually arrived in what is today Green Bay, Wisconsin, and they weren't alone. It's estimated over 20,000 Native people were displaced and made refugees because of the Beaver Wars. Eventually, uh, the French were able to supply Native groups in this area with things that they needed because at that time the French and Miami and Potawatomi and other Native groups living here were trading with each other and they were able to fight back and eventually push the Iroquois back to where they were living previously along the East Coast and the Miami and Potawatomi were able to return later in the late 1600s. But even before Europeans and the French were in this area trading with the Miami and Potawatomi living, living here, the native groups were already being affected by the fur trade. So it's a, one of the many things that comes out of the fur trade and kind of talks about how it's much bigger than just trading furs for goods. Now, as you might think, as different cultures came together during this fur trade, Miami, Potawatomi, French, British, American, uh, all at different times, there's a number of different issues that could take place. Uh, just kind of think about if you were meeting a new group of people or you went to a foreign country like the French fur traders did, the first ones to come here in the late 1600s, what are some of the problems or issues you might think? One of the easiest ones and the one I want to talk about right now is the language barrier. So imagine a French fur trader comes over the Atlantic Ocean, travels down a number of rivers by canoe, arrives at a native village, let's just say for this example, Miami, comes into the Miami village, is greeted by the people, and then them what? How are they gonna to talk to each other? What's gonna be the problem? Because the French fur trader does not speak the Miami language, the Miami people, if this is the first time they have encountered a fur trader, they don't speak French, how are they gonna trade? How are they gonna build that relationship? How are they gonna build trust? So throughout the progression of the fur trade, there were things that both groups did to make communication simple. And just one real uh, easy example here is this blanket. So this is a blanket made by the Hudson Bay Company. They're a, they're a fur trading company that produced a number of goods. And what I wanna point out on this uh, blanket here are these four black bars or points as what they were called. This was one of the ways that the language barrier was broken. Now, this was a, something that had to be learned by both fur traders and native groups, but when they saw a blanket like this, this was one way they could get around the language barrier. And these points were the main method of communication. So think of these as the easiest way to think about it and compare it to something we have today. Think about this as kind of like this blanket's price tag. So it was universal that no matter what culture you belong to, Miami, Potawatomi here, other native groups throughout North America, French fur traders, British fur traders, Americans, 
whoever came in contact with Hudson Bay blankets. Once they learned this, they knew when they were trading or purchasing these things to look at these points. So this particular blanket has four points on it. And that tells us two things. One, it would tell you the quality of the wool made in this blanket. The other thing is, is it tells you its size. So when they were trading, uh, you would look at these points. Once you knew what that meant, you would see them over and over again when this particular blanket was traded. And that could tell you a few things, especially in negotiations. You would know, like say for example, if this had more points, it would be a better blanket. So it would be more desirable. Or if it had little point, if it had less points, it wouldn't be as good. So maybe you were able to strike a better deal with all these different things. So this is one of the ways that fur traders and native groups uh, worked through their issues, especially when it came to fur trading. So as time went on, more and more of these things would happen. As more and more trading took place, both these groups would learn each other's languages. So by the time near the end of the fur trade, in the 1800s here in this region, in the early 1800s, if you were a fur trader and you came across a native village, you came into a native village, you probably were able to speak enough of that native language that you were able to conduct business uh, properly and successfully. And the same thing goes for native groups. They were learning French and English as well uh, through, as time went on. So this was one of the early ways that they were able to work through um, a language barrier. And just think of other issues that the fur traders and native cultures would have. And think about if you were living back then, what are some of the ways you would work through those problems? Another impact of this fur trade occurred when uh, the British came into this area and began to trading with native groups. So initially in the late 1600s and through the first half of the 1700s, the French were in this region trading with the Miami and Potawatomi and other native groups that lived in the region. After the French and Indian War in the 1750s with the British being victorious, the French were removed or kicked out, the British moved in. And while the French and the British had different philosophies when it came to how they traded and how they looked at the native groups, the French, saw it more as a partnership and more of a business. So the way they traded with the Potawatomi in Miami that lived in this region is they built trust. They integrated themselves in the villages. The French would explain culture and the native people would talk about their culture with the French. It was a back and forth exchange. And then when they were doing business, it seemed fairly open and fair. When the British came here in the 1750s, just victorious off of a war against the French and many uh, native allies, the British saw trading a little bit differently. And they saw it as a way to control the native people who they had already fought a war against. So the, how the main, main way that the fur trade changed was they restricted or stopped giving native people certain things through the trade. We talked about the value of firearms and how important they were for hunting and protection and really through the fur trade. Uh, European traders were trading, trading firearms and that was probably one of their more valuable things. Um, when, the French, or in the, when the French were here, they would openly trade because they were allies with the Miami and Potawatomi. The British did something different. They decided to restrict how many firearms and how many bullets and gunpowder was traded. That way they felt that they could control the native population. So this is one way where the fur trade was used in a negative sense. So by being able to control the amount of firearms out there, they were ensuring the protection of British people, or at least that's what they thought. The other thing that they did was they used blankets in a way to make sure if when fighting happened, like say for example, as less and less firearms were being traded, and the native people started to take wit started to notice and started to say things and speak up and say, you know, we want to be treated more fairly in the trade. The British uh, had a negative reaction to that. And what led to a number of uprisings, the native groups banded together uh, under native leaders like Little Turtle and Pontiac and began attacking British forts because they want to be treated fit fairly. Uh, and be all because the, the trade had changed because this new group, the British, were now trading with these native partners.
So they restricted firearms, the British did, and then the other thing did, they did through the trade is as these uprisings were taking place, uh, the British wanted to make sure that the natives were defeated, so they actually used the fur trade as a way of what we would call today biological warfare. So they would take blankets to, with people who had smallpox, which was a very deadly disease at the time. They used the blankets for people who had smallpox. They would give them those blankets, and then they would take those blankets and trade them with the native groups. Now, the native groups were unaware of the fact that these were blankets that were, had smallpox on them. And having no immunity and no ability to care for the disease, and as soon as those blankets were traded and entered into a native community, uh, very quickly people would start to contract that and a number of people uh, in a village could die. And just to take that and expand it across the entire Great Lakes region, this idea of biological and germ warfare uh, was one way using trading that was seen as a negative light. And the British were using that over and over again to, in a way to control native populations. So while we do see the fur trade as a, an exchange of culture, it can also be used for bad reasons as well, as a way to try to control the people you're trading with. So that's one negative aspect of it. So here we have items that the Europeans, French, British, and later Americans were bringing to the table when they were trading with the Miami and Potawatomi that lived here. And from the items that you see here, they symbolize things that were used every day, tools, things for protection, and things that improved on upon ways that native groups were living. So let's kind of explore some of these things. Uh, first thing, some of the things that you see here are pots and pans. So we have a Dutch oven, we have a brass kettle, and we have a clay pot. Now, all these could be used for cooking, cleaning, heating up water. Uh, just think of all the things we use pots and pans for today. Now, what made these valuable for native groups is the material that they are made out of. They were made out of metal, and that was one of the things that these European and American groups were introducing in the fur trade, metal made objects. Because the Miami and Potawatomi that lived here and native groups really in all of North America had not harnessed the ability to heat up metal and form it and shape it. So these were a change in the way that they were cooking, say for example. Um, the things that they were using were made out of hides or were made out of uh, dugout uh, gourds uh, that they would hollow out and use to carry things. So when these brought, when European traders and American traders brought these over, pots and pans like these greatly improved the way native groups were cooking, for example. Because a pot like this can go directly onto a fire. They didn't have to worry about it being damaged. It would heat up much faster. It would stay warm for much longer. So these things really kind of enhanced the abilities of native people to uh, cook and clean and a number of other different things. So those are some things that might get used every day. Another thing that they, would, that they introduced were different forms of tools. So we have, for example, here uh, an ax or a hatchet. So native groups, uh, Miami and Potawatomi, were using these tools themselves. They had developed them, archaic people developed them thousands of years ago, um, but they were mostly made out of stone. So again, introducing a metal blade that could be sharpened, uh, made it much easier to use for all the different things, whether it was chopping down trees, whether it was using it to create their wigwams that they lived in, whether it was used to skin animals that they would use for, to trade in the furs in return for items like these. These metal blades uh, were very much an improvement upon the stone tools. And as you can imagine, they would last longer. They could be sharpened, so they could be used over and over again. Um, once, say for example, using a stone ax uh, that it was reused, it would be shortened down to a nub and it would be discarded and then you'd have to start all over. This could be sharpened over and over again and be used many more times. So it's a much more efficient tool. Um, we have some things that provided comfort for these native groups. And I'm talking about these examples, these blankets here. So I'll hold this one up. You can see the brown one as well. These blankets were made from wool. So the traders 
the European American traders were introducing wool blankets, which changed the way uh, native groups lived and it provided more comfort. These things kept you more warmer. This being wool, when it was raining out, they would cover themselves in this, and this would provide the uh, warmth and the dryness that you might need because when you would wear this and it would rain, they didn't have to worry about getting wet because it would absorb a lot of the water as opposed to the animal skins that many native people were using. Uh, once those got wet and soaked, it took a really long time to warm up. Some of the things that native groups de demanded or wanted in the fur trade were not things that they could use to improve their life for cooking or cleaning or comfort. They were just things that they needed. So think about that today, the things that you might own. Are there things that you don't need to survive, but you like to have them? The best example come that I can think of is jewelry. You know, many of us wear jewelry, whether it's rings or earrings or bracelets or even watches, things like that. We don't necessarily need those things, but they're important to us and we have value. So we have a few examples of these here. We have uh, a bangle that was made out of gold or brass that native people thought was decorative and that they would wear on their arms. We have a gorget that they would wear around their neck and military European and American military used these as a symbol of status and the native people adopted that as well. And even simple things like, as you can see here, uh, uh, a mirror. So once again, not something that you might need to survive, but was something desired. One of the things that in a particular cultural group that we know that the, this group adopted and used for their ornamentation in their clothing, think about the Miami and beadwork. Miami Native Americans were trading for beads and that eventually worked their way into their culture, which today um, the Miami have, are known for, and they have been known for decades, for their intricate beadwork on their clothing or their bags or things like that. Now, all of these things were important, but probably the most vital or most, uh, the biggest thing that was traded for, which really changed the way Miami, Potawatomi, and other native groups lived, were firearms. So guns like these, now, as you can see, this is one made out of wood and a model we use for programs like this, so it's not an actual firearm. But firearms really changed everything. So if you were a native group and you were obtaining firearms and gunpowder and bullets, um, this could really change the way you hunted and really help you protect yourself. So imagine if you're the only group of Miami living in this area and during the Beaver War, say for example, and you have firearms, you, you were trading and you were given firearms to the trade, you were much better equipped to defend yourself. And when it came to the fur trade, think about how, uh, how easier it would have been to hunt. These firearms could shoot further, they could shoot faster, they are more efficient than hunting tools that uh, the Miami and Potawatomi were using prior to trading with Europeans. So it was something that worked its way in and was one of the major things that were traded that native people desired and wanted because it really helped them. Now with all of these items, you might ask yourself or you might be thinking, did native people really abandon and really change the way that they lived? And the answer is no, because you look at all these things, these were things that they were already using. This was a different and a better version. So some people think during the fur trade that native groups, when they started using these, they started to lose their identity of who they were. That's not true. Uh, just think about it today. You know, if you have an old pot or an old blanket and you buy a new one, does that change who you are? No. Uh, you just have a better version. And that's what these things really symbolized. And these were things amongst many other things that Europeans and American traders were bringing to native communities, the Miami and Potawatomi that lived in this area, and providing things that they were able to trade with. And next we'll talk about what native people brought to the table in return. So let's take a look at that. So here is what native people would have brought to the fur trade. And the reason why we call it the fur trade, they brought animal furs with them. And you see the variety of different furs. And this is just a small example of all different types of furs that Miami and Potawatomi that lived here would have been bringing uh, 
to the negotiations to be able to trade for a number of different items. And the question is, how do we determine which one has more value? Is one of these furs more valuable than the other? Uh, how and why was that determined? Well, it was all determined for a number of different things. Just like today, we determine prices for items, whether they're easy to get, whether there's a lot of them, whether it's big, whether it's small, all those different types of things. So uh, it was mostly determined by size of an animal fur, the number of population of the animal in that area and how easy they were to hunt. And the other thing was what they could be used for and how, and, and how much Europeans wanted them for their own goods. So let's take a look at some of these furs and talk about their value. So one of the things that we mentioned was determining value was the size. So if you take, for example, this rabbit fur or I'll hold this other one up, this is a woodchuck. We can see that if you hold them together, they're not very large. And the other thing is they didn't give much value because if you think about what these could be made into, because that was the end goal for these furs, that they would be changed into something that people could wear or something people could use. These don't have a lot of uses. Like say, for example, rabbit fur, as you can see how small it is, would make something like good for the lining of mittens, but imagine how many rabbits you needed to trade for to make something like a coat. Uh, so size would determine. So things like rabbits and woodchucks, just because of their small size, were very valuable. The other thing is we determine is the number of uh, the animal population in a region. So if there's more animals, the less valuable that fur would be. And that's true with things like, as you can see here, raccoons so even think about today how often you see raccoons even in your own neighborhood they're still pretty prevalent today or things like a gray fox now gray fox uh, populations in indiana aren't very large today but during the fur trade they were um, thankfully they're being reintroduced into the wild so numbers are going up today but during the time of the fur trade fox fur was easy to find and easy to trap so these were probably more valuable than things like rabbits because they were bigger or woodchucks but because there were so many of them they uh, didn't have a lot of value they could be used for value too but thinking about how these were used if for example see this fox fur um, it didn't take a lot to process and the most important thing it could be used for is a scarf so just think about when it's cold in the winter and your neck is cold, you can just take it and wrap it around. And then you have a nice scarf that just like how we use today, instead of fabric, you would have fox fur. But because of their numbers, they weren't very valuable either. And that brings me to this biggest, the biggest fur we have on the table here. So I'll hold it up so you can see. This is a deer fur. Now it's big. But once again, if we think about animal populations, deer are easy to be found. Um, there's lots of them. The population is pretty prevalent here in our area. So despite its size, um, it would be pretty common. So the value of that wouldn't be very big. Now, if you're looking at this entire table, you might think to yourself, the deer fur would be the most valuable because it's the biggest, but that wouldn't be correct. And the most valuable fur on this table, and I have two examples, are beaver fur. So it didn't matter if it was a small beaver like this one or a really large beaver fur like this. So you can see how big that is. That's a pretty large beaver that would garner probably the most value for lots of things. So beavers are what really drove the fur trade. Uh, we talked about the beaver fur in an earlier, or the beaver wars in an earlier segment. So beavers caused conflict in, in North America. And even in hundreds, over a hundred years of fur trading, beavers were always the most popular. And the reason was what they could be made into. So beaver fur, because of, if you think about all these animals and all the furs we have on this table, you think about beaver fur, it's one of the things is it's one of the softest furs. The other thing is think about the beaver's habitat and their environment, what they live in. Beavers spend a lot of the time in water, so their fur has adapted and evolved over the years to become waterproof. It makes it nice and slick and it, and it dries off really quick. So that we talk about the 
demand that the Europeans wanted, they demanded beaver fur because of those properties and they would turn it into felt. And the demand for beaver fur became high because one of the main things that beaver fur was turned into were hats like this. So this is a top hat made from beaver fur. And also it was being pushed by famous Americans. So say for example, one of our founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, when he was in France, he would wear a beaver skin hat and that look became very popular in France. So more and more people wanted beavers. So much so the beavers go almost go completely extinct. And if you're trading with beavers, if you had a beaver fur, you could demand some of the most expensive items. Think about other furs that we don't have on this table, big animals like bears or bison. Beaver furs were even more valuable than those. So you could get for one beaver fur, you could really ask for whatever you wanted. And as the fur trade went on and on, more and more traders were willing to give up some of their most prized valuable items for beaver fur. So beaver fur was really the most important and really kind of pushed the fur trade, but all of these other furs played an important role. Whether it was the smallest fur to a rabbit, big furs like the deer skin, common furs like the raccoon or the most valuable beaver. So native groups were providing these in return for all the items that the Europeans provided. So let's talk about how that actually would work when these two groups. So now that we've learned what fur traders and natives were bringing to the fur trade, this is what an actual fur trade may have looked like back when native people and traders were trading in the 16, 17 and 1800s. So what would happen is a fur trader would come to a native village here in this area, Miami of Potawatomi, and they would enter into the village and they would take multiple trips to build relationships and build trust. Because that was the one important thing. Both these groups needed to trust each other if they were going to trade. So they had to build a relationship uh, and build a trust. And when they would bring these items into the village, native people would present their furs and they may just lay them on a blanket like this. So each group could see everything that was being offered. So you had to think about when you were trading, if you were native, um, what type of items did the fur traders bring that you would want or need? And the same goes for the fur traders. What type of furs would you want from your native partners? So it was what you wanted, but it was also, what are you willing to give up? So, because if you wanted something from the other side, you had to give up one of these things. So would you be willing to give up your most prized possession, which we talked about earlier, what the French would bring would be their firearms. Or if you're a native, were you willing to give up a beaver fur for one of these items? So it was a negotiation. You could say yes, you could say no, you could change things. So let's play out one of these examples. Say for example, let's pretend that we're Miami or Potawatomi. And we look at these items here and let's say for example, you would want this ax. So we'll put it right here in the middle. Okay, so that's the one thing a native person would want or something that a trader would offer. Now, what are you willing to give up? Would you give up a woodchuck? Let's take a look. Is that something you'd be willing to give up? Would you be willing to give up a fox fur? All those different types of things. Would you be willing to maybe not give up a fox fur, but maybe it's a combination of two things. Maybe you are willing to give up a rabbit fur and a woodchuck for this ax. So it was all those different types of things and you could go back and forth until they made an agreement. So. We're going to give you some examples here and I'm going to lay out some trading examples and I want you to think about would you be willing to trade this or are these a good trade? I want you to think about why or why not. If you're a native or if you're a fur trader uh, on either side, would you be willing to give up these items? And I want you to think about why you would make those decisions.
So those were some examples. I hope you thought about why you would trade or not trade those items or would you want to change it? And I hope you came up with good decisions and maybe you're a good trader, maybe not. So like I said, this is all about what you think is more valuable, what people wanted, what you could get for these items, what you could use these items for. So it really was a discussion going back and forth. So I hope you made good decisions. I hope you're a good trader and I hope you learned a little bit about the fur trade. So we'll see you next time and thank you for joining us.